Well, I'd like to, have, uh, like to welcome everyone to the uh, AWP Community of Practice webinar series. Uh, believe it or not, this is number 28 of 29. So um, in the first 10 years, we did 17. And in the last nine months, we've done 28. So uh, uh, we picked things up quite a bit. Anyway, uh, Steve, could you take us to the next slide? Um, if you haven't joined already, uh, you really should join the community of practice. And also, uh, a, a really good tip is to invite your connections, because if you're getting value out of this, when you invite your connections, they will also be able to uh, join in. There's no cost. And this way, you'll be made aware of which events are coming up. and uh, uh, you'll be able to, if you missed one, you'll be able to pick it up on uh, demand. So uh, I don't want to cut into any more of the group's time. So Steve, could you uh, launch the session, please? Improving supply chain performance is key to maximizing the benefits of advanced work packaging programs, which can help firms realize a potential 25% improvement in productivity and a 10% reduction in total installed cost. In this presentation, you will learn how to advance the supply chain in two areas. First, an owner and contractor will discuss early supplier engagement and then three implementation support companies will discuss methods for improving track and trace capability. You'll also grasp how to improve the coordination of the supply chain with AWP practices and get a much needed boost for supply chain management. Here to present, please welcome Mike Reed, Robert Manali, Mark Meta. John Walker, and William Chatterton. All right, so hello everyone, and welcome to a presentation on modernizing the supply chain and increasing the value of advanced work packaging. Uh, we got a group of professionals here uh, from the industry. I'm Mike Reed with Dow. Uh, I lead a team of uh, material management professionals at Dow working advanced work packaging and supporting uh, capital projects at, at Dow. Uh, Robert, John, Mark, and uh, William will introduce themselves as they come up in the presentation. Uh, so real brief on the agenda for what we're going to talk about a couple of sections. Uh, the importance of early supplier engagement, and then transition to a discussion on the importance of improved track and trace, and then close out uh, with a summary of some information that you can get uh, from a recently completed uh, CII uh, research team. So if we move into earlier supplier engagement, so Robert and I are going to take this. So Robert, if you would introduce yourself at this point, and then we'll get started. Right. My name is Robert Manali. I'm with Cajun Industries. Been in the industry 25 years. Uh, my, my responsibility with Cajun are predominantly a project director over straight construction, GC opportunities, as well as EPC. And I'm also the AWP champion. All right. Thanks, Robert. So we're going to transition and look at just kind of a back and forth discussion about the importance of early supplier engagement. Uh, from an owner and a contractor perspective. So looking at an owner perspective of, of the supplier engagement, we really want to understand and collaborate with suppliers in particular uh, in ways that can save money, reduce time, give schedule assurance. And, and one of the first things here is really understanding and working with uh, suppliers to understand what fabrication they may have in their technology uh, improvements over the over time. Maybe we haven't worked with somebody in a while, so we want to really keep tabs on that as we're going into a new large project. And again, 
the second part of this is trying to make sure that we have, have schedule assurance, including timing to meet path of construction as we set it with advanced work packaging, and also to understand the lead times in the POs and make sure that we're structuring those to get the desired delivery date, but also under get the total purchase for negotiating price. And then I'll let Robert, you know, come in here with the contractor's perspective. Uh, not too shocking, the contractor uh, mirrors many of those uh, uh, same, same things that we believe are important. Ability to team up with the owners, also to uh, vet the suppliers. Obviously, we also have our uh, uh, preferred suppliers and things of that nature, and they need to look at multiple suppliers, shop production, study and identify and tagging and things of that nature, which is going to be discussed uh, later on by some of the other participants. Uh, coordinate with the owner and with the engineering uh, in order to develop our path of construction and uh, uh, with the procurement in mind. Uh, I think a lot of us uh, have realized over time that AWP process, uh, a lot of people like the uh, the process and they understand the construction and the engineering side, but I think the procurement side has been one of those uh, opportunity and, uh, uh, and I believe it's important that we're having this discussion, but we're assuring that in, uh, issuance of the engineering deliverables uh, or make it feasible for material delivery dates. You know, procurement can only get what we have from engineering, so all the earlier the better, and then uh, establishing that optimum sequence for material delivery to meet that path construction, which can produce a, a reduction in overall laydown requirements, which is a, another kind of sidebar thing that we can look at total install costs anytime we can do things. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree with that last point, Robert, too, because there is uh, usually limited space at the job site, to, and so staying on this path of construction and bringing materials in almost in a just-in-time uh, perspective is, can be very important as well. So if we shift uh, from that to expected improvements, just kind of again optimizing the cost and what we you know one of these things uh, better planning should lead to less change orders which typically uh, impact schedule and cost uh, pretty significantly again the owner is looking at uh, a schedule assurance we don't want impacts to the construction schedule so better planning and engagement with suppliers should give us some of that and then finally, especially for projects doing advanced work packaging, but others as well, this data management, we wanna look at, you know, how are we doing with fabrication versus the schedule uh, that we need for getting materials to the job site. Uh, another point there is really trying to set up the points of contract, contact between the supplier and the uh, material management professional, supply chain management professionals, so people know who to go to uh, when there are issues that need to be addressed in setting up this, uh, typically a single point of contact uh, usually works pretty good for that. From, from the contractor's perspective, a lot of similarities, but uh, you know, by having earlier engagement, you know, your material deliver, delivery should and most likely will meet the path of construction, i.e. the construction execution interruptions will be minimized. Fewer change orders for out of sequence activities and schedule extension. You know, if we have the material, obviously we're doing the things following the process. Uh, many of the jobs, because the procurement hasn't met it, we've had to deviate from the process. And anytime you do the deviation, costs time and money. Uh, we'll be able to integrate with suppliers with integration of the suppliers with our construction team as well as the owner to improve tracking. So kind of what Mike was talking about, setting up the flow of information, making sure that the, uh, uh, the suppliers have the ability to provide us the data in a way, not only the traditional spreadsheet and uh, email, but in a way that it can be inputted into the uh, uh, programs that we utilize for work, pack, you know, work packaging. And then, you know, key to everything, and, and Mike and I talked about this uh, offline even before this, was this full transparency between the owner, suppliers, and the contractor. Because the answer is, if anybody's not able to meet it, we can only mitigate it with early, uh, uh, early uh, timing of that information. So, you know, instead of having the siloed owner, supplier, contractor, is uh, more teaming. Yeah, and I, 
Yeah, it's a great point, Robert. And I think that what we saw in the projects that uh, Dow and Cajuns actually worked together is this transparency is is provided a dual win-win situation for us, uh, both companies. All right, so costs and benefits, the next section, um, you know, really taking some data from this, uh, you know, transition out of uh, RT363 research team and looking at you know, what's this next level of, you know, discussion and how do we engage and talk about more details of the cost benefits than was able to be presented in early September when that uh, project team presented. Um, from an owner's perspective, you really have to have commitment and engagement to collaborate with suppliers on a regular basis. So most companies do have approved supplier lists, uh, some process to review performance and feedback, um, but maybe the part that's being missed at times is, do you do that on a regular basis? Do you engage your suppliers to talk about the technology improvements that they have in place? And um, from an owner perspective, a lot of times it takes a while for us to look at uh, fabrication changes uh, from an engineering perspective. And so if you are having regular it's about technology, that really puts us in a place where we can evaluate new fabrication technologies and take advantage of those on the next project as opposed to trying to do it in a very rushed position. And sometimes what you might be feeling or hearing from an owner is they just do everything like you did last time. And if you're not really having those regular discussions, you miss out some opportunities for, for cost and schedule changes. But really it comes down to, you know, we are looking at how can we improve cost and, and optimize our purchasing cost, but also improve our overall uh, total install cost with the AWP process. So when we look at the past research teams, uh, RT272 in particular says, you know, up to 10% is available versus historical project execution. 63 came in and and really split that is you know we get four or so from great work face planning and the other six percent really comes from a fully integrated uh, supply chain process with the advanced work packaging processes yeah and you know from a contractor's perspective uh, you know we'll have to get the early resources uh, from from us to support this uh, supplier engagement and Increasing confidence in the project schedule due to, you know, having predictable delivery of materials. We're looking for that reduced TIC due to extension of overhead costs. So contractor will be able to do things that will be able to help the client, obviously, to make the job more viable for them. You know, if we can shorten our schedule or at least maintain our schedule that we agreed to in the estimate, obviously, that's a, a huge uh, uh, improvement. I already kind of talked about the temporary facilities. Uh, that's offices and things of that nature, but again, back to the laydown, and then a big hit is the construction costs of the equipment that we'll rent. Many of these jobs, heavy uh, uh, heavy equipment requirements that uh, uh, are not not cheap, cost a lot of money. If there's a delay in a, a major vessel or things of that nature, we end up paying to get a, a piece of equipment on site because we have to hold it, and it's a lot of costs that uh, uh, that get driven by not having that coordination with the suppliers. And finally, improve quality of the work and safety exposure, reduce safety exposure. You know, back to the, the whole thing. You know, we have this, we have our uh, processes, we make our packages, we're out there doing the work. If we don't have the material, we decide to deviate. We're having to move from an area. That means people didn't finish what they were doing, have to go to another area, come back. Each time that happens, it may be a different crew. You're just giving yourself an opportunity to uh, not have the quality of work that you would expect. And obviously, anytime you remobilize, that's another uh, potential for safety. Oh, absolutely. And, and thanks for bringing that point, too, is, is, you know, if you don't have a piece of equipment like a big vessel and you leave a hole in the structure, you're just asking for uh, somebody maybe to, you know, fall into a safety, potential safety hazard there. So, 
a good point on that one. Um, looking. All right, as we move into our <clears throat> our final slide of this section of overcoming implementation barriers, <clears throat> from an owner's uh, perspective, we really have to have a group or a single champion with the right level of influence to drive change through the organization. Change management is always a challenge, and so you really need to look at how would we manage that uh, with the people that do need to change and then training the people resources. And finally, uh, a budget for people uh, to develop and implement these new work processes. It does seem that these do these kind of big uh, institutionalized type changes may take more time uh, than originally thought. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you may need to have an extra year or two as you're going through making these type of big changes within your organization. And from contractor side, you know, we have to have that commitment to provide those. Uh, we have only so many people that we can provide uh, within our organization that have the, the right level of skill. We're, you know, I believe all the contractors or many of our uh, uh, fellow contractors are all gravitating and improving and increasing our training and number of folks that are available. But no matter how many you get, it, it's still so many, there's only so many that are gonna be at SME level that would be able to really be able to support that early uh, implementation. Um, it's imperative that you get the right people to do it, not just someone that's been placeholdered into it. Uh, we'll, we are continuing on the contractor side to get that training for the people but it's kind of a symbiotic situation with the contractor and the client. The more projects that do it, the more that we're able to be involved, the better obviously that uh, both sides will become in it. And, you know, supporting from owners for that early engagement costs, um, you know, during the feed estimate phase, you know, FEL three, whatever the term that the different uh, uh, owners use is understanding to incorporate that into that TIC. So, Obviously, there's savings, but there's costs, and we have to have it allocated so that uh, there won't be an issue with uh, uh, the right type. And, and, you know, that early talking needs to happen. And, of course, uh, uh, I believe that's part of this uh, discussion. And then, you know, sharing the risk for the AWP execution, you know, and develop trust in the, in, in the field processes. So by having that early engagement with the contractor and the client, we start to get uh, to where we trust one another, we can team to one another we can work out different opportunities for one another to be successful. Yeah, I, I think that if I was to leave one final point in this site, this early, open, and honest communication between all parties of the project is key to finding these opportunities for improvements. So at this point, we're going to take uh, and move into the second part of the presentation. So I'm going to turn over to John Walker uh, to talk about improved track and trace. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Mike. Really good points you guys made there from kind of early engagement and the owners and contractors perspective. So I do want to transition now into talking about uh, improved track and trace and how to optimize track and trace solutions. Um, I'm going to be joined on stage here with Mark Meta of iConstruct uh, and Bill Chatterton of CBOX. And my name is John Walker. I'm with Atlas RFID Solutions. I'm currently vice president of strategic services for Atlas. Uh, my background has been in supply chain, field materials management, as well as implementing different solutions from a technology perspective for EPCs and owners as it relates to digital supply chain and track and trace uh, technologies on project sites. So, you know, it, we, sometimes we think about track and trace as attaching an RFID tag or some sort of auto ID uh, to an item and then tracking it through the supply chain, which that is valid, um, you know, understanding of track and trace, but there's really more to it, uh, especially as it relates to AWP and then some of the findings of the recent uh, research team. So um, obviously there is a digital component to a track and trace implementation. Uh, and we kind of look at that as almost like a digital supply chain side of things, I'll touch on that. But more importantly, there is a data element to, um, you know, to a track and trace and, and, and really how you effectively use that data that is captured upstream and throughout the supply chain. Uh, and that really comes in place with kind of visualizing that information in the model. Uh, and lastly, there's this physical enablement of track and trace and really of, of work packaging as it comes to material handling and logistics support of how you package those items. 
Uh, so if we take a look at the digital supply chain, really what we mean by that is, you know, utilizing a tool that can be extended out to the supplier to help digitally capture the items that should be expected on the job site, taking that information and then tying it back to the work package, work plan, whatever, however you're defining your scopes of work on the job site from a digital side of things uh, is super important. And really being able to understand the status of those items as it relates to the supply chain and how does that impact your construction schedule? Is it going to be late? Is it going to be early? Or is it going to be on time? And really understanding that uh, and then taking that data and sharing it downstream, really trying to get that 100% positive material location and identification, knowing what you really have on site. So once we start gathering this information upstream and throughout the supply chain, then we can take that information and push it into a model. Uh, you know, a great example of that is what iConstruct has and be able to visualize some of the supply chain and some of the different status coding uh, that's available in the model as you're looking and planning your work in the field, you can use real time supply chain information and being able to use that information is captured upstream uh, throughout the supply chain to visualize that it, it's really important. And then obviously being able to take information not only from, uh, you know, the main material management system on site, but also combining from other different tools that are being used during project execution. There may be multiple different materials management systems in use, but being able to consume all of those different data points uh, into some sort of single common model environment to visualize the status of, of what you can and can't work on is, is vitally important. And then, as I mentioned, there comes down to the process of the physical enablement of, of really more packaging. And, and so how are you actually grouping your materials together at the supplier's facilities in a logical sequence to ship to site is, is vitally important. You know, you don't want to go dump them all into a sea can because you don't get a mess once you get on the job site. So being able to sequence your work, pack those goods in a logical manner with systems such as the IWS model uh, system from CBOX, uh, is, is super important in being able to track those items around your job site and throughout the supply chain in a group format so you can issue those all to construction in one single push is, uh, is, is really important. And so I do want to, you know, what we're going to do is break down each of these buckets into a more deeper explanation here. And what I want to touch on first is really kind of the data and the digital supply chain enablement piece. Uh, so I'm going to dig in and, and talk a little bit about the tech side of things, nerd out a little bit on the software. Uh, what that looks like from a supplier's perspective, uh, when they are, you know, attaching RFID tags or what the solution should look like uh, when, when you do engage with these suppliers. And, and I think the biggest piece of that is it needs to be simple. You know, it doesn't need to be super, um, you know, difficult for somebody to use. It doesn't need to be hardware heavy. Uh, it needs to be a simple, elegant solution, and that really comes in play for, for all different types of technologies that we implement throughout construction. But uh, talk, touch a little bit on the digital supply chain here, and, and what I mean by that is, is, number one, it's really the digital packing list creation. So asking for a packing list from a supplier is not a new novel concept in our industry. Uh, getting it on time, getting it in a consistent format, you know, that, that, that's where your challenge lies. So really some of the stuff that Mike and Robert were talking about were early engagement to set the data standard for the project site to eliminate a lot of the waiting on this paper packing list and then trying to figure out what you have actually arrived on the job site. It's, you know, working with the suppliers early to digitally transform all the components into data attributes that can be linked back to the work plan. This obviously helps with a couple big things. It's elimination of the unmanaged ship loose you know, where's my strainer, where's my anchor bolts, where are these little pieces that go to the main tag that oftentimes cause problems, uh, which really leads to full visibility of constraint-free IWPs, which I think we're, you know, we're driving to in this industry is to reduce the number of constraints on work packages well ahead of actually work commencing. Uh, and then, you know, obviously there's a, there's a need that's been documented for years about using RFID and different types of auto identification of field for materials. You know, being able to work upstream and engage these suppliers early can help you, uh, you know, put RFID tags and barcodes on items to then understand what those items are, you know, whether it be tracking them through the supply chain or understanding what you have once they arrive at the job site. It makes things so much easier from a transactional side of things uh, to, to really have that program in place. So let's see what this looks like, right? What does it look like? You know, we say, hey, we're going to make all these suppliers start using some digital system. Well, you know, some examples here of what the software could look like. It, it's pretty simple, right? You know, step one is after the spool or steel has been fabricated, the supplier can log into an app and say, hey, this item has been fabricated, 
updates the status, which then gives a time and date stamp, which can populate into other technologies downstream to provide visibility into you know, where the fabricator is at with this item. Uh, and then simply attach an RFID tag and scan the bark on an RFID tag. And now you've associated the RFID tag to the material to then track it through the supply chain. Uh, and that's, you know, there's no real fancy hardware included in this. It's using the integrated camera that's in the, uh, on the device you're using already, such as an iPhone or Android, tablet, whatever it may be. Uh, don't have to have an additional RFID reader to, to do those associations. So that's a, that's a really big piece. So once you have the RFID tags placed onto the items, then you want to physically load them into some logical sequence, right? Like I said, you don't want to dump them all onto the back of a truck or dump them all into a sea can. You want to logically load them. Uh, this picture here is an example of the IWS module from uh, T-Box. And you see we could have maybe a couple different tiers that are on that IWS that are broken down by installation work package. So when those arrive at the job site, it makes it really easy for the guys in the field to A, store it, and B, issue those out and know they have all the goods needed for that package for installation. So that's that's a really important piece. And, and, and the other aspect, kind of taking the digital side of things, is really understanding all the components that are tied to that IWS unit. Uh, so I can go into an app and then be able to not only RFID tag the schools, but then also RFID tag the container that it's coming in to get benefits of tracking the whole unit around the site and then push that information and data into other systems used for project execution. Um, so, you know, track and trace doesn't necessarily just apply to a supplier fabricator facility or your job site. There could be gate readers spread throughout your supply chain. If we look at traditional construction supply chains, there, there's a lot of nodes to them and there's a lot of different places materials can end up. So being able to automatically capture some of these material deliveries at these sites, off-site facilities, at your project site, uh, and then they, you know, make earlier notification of material arrivals with such as this gate reader that you see in this picture that can scan a container, can scan a school, can scan any of these RFID tags that have been associated upstream, really allows for early notification of material arrivals. Uh, and then obviously the, uh, the big thing about track and trace, right, is, is, is where are my materials? And so, you know, a big piece of uh, track and trace solution for years has been take the items that come on site and attach a GPS location to those so that when construction needs that IWS or needs that individual school, they can go uh, and find that easily through GPS and, and RFID. And so that's really optimizing the use of uh, the track and trace implementation. This is really kind of how we get the data started in this side of things. And and I do want to flip it over to, um, to Mark now and and have him run through you know, some ways that they're using data from a track and trace perspective to help execution on projects. All right, thanks for that, John Walker. Uh, John Walker does have some, uh, as we saw, uh, a teaser for some of their information they're gonna display later in the conference as well. But unfortunately, you won't be able to see it because our presentation's on at the same time, so come watch I Construct. It's very important that you see what we have. It's really neat stuff. So my name is Mark Meta. I'm with iConstruct. I want to start out with, with a, a little bit of a appreciation and thanks for uh, Stephen and Lloyd. So they've been, before the ADVP conference, there was the Workpage Planning Conference and they've been sponsoring these for years and they're selling out and more attendees. And now we're going virtual, which isn't easy to do. So seeing a little bit behind the scenes, you see how much they put into this. I want to say thanks to them. Uh, let's see. So we're going to talk about some of the information that we have uh, with material supply chain um, and what do we what do we do with it so uh, we capture that information from RFID systems uh, we can capture it from multiple sources in this case the most the most beneficial way of working this is with an uh, RFID system well how does, how does everyone see it then so we, what we'd like to do is to pull it together and sometimes we call it an IDE integrated data environment so in this simple case, this is just ISO, grid location, RFID status. So that a lot of this is the information that we receive from a, a Jovix system or Jovix type system. Uh, the key to this is that, a couple keys is that we can pull information from multiple sources, but also uh, when you look at an MMS report, they tend to be huge, which is very useful when things go wrong, you can track back and see what happened when and how many parts and pieces are left and who was it wrecked out to. 
but on a regular basis, when things are going smooth, which hopefully most of the time it is, right? Uh, then we just want the information that's going to be pertinent to the planners and also to the rest of the project. So when we do this IDE, Integrated Data Environment, uh, it's largely for work-based planning and advanced work packaging, but that doesn't mean that just those individuals of those titles look at this information. So it's going to be uh, your field engineers, material management themselves. You can uh, have uh, uh, schedulers use the model quite a bit in terms of looking for information and uh, planning activities. Uh, so the next thing we're going to look at here is, all right, we're at an ADVP conference, so you can't have an ADVP conference without a color code. So now there's a color code. So we take the information from uh, a, an MMS or from uh, Jovix Atlas RFID. We put that into the model and we color the model different colors, and we've all seen that before, right? All right, so let's move on from the color code. Uh, what can we do? What's, what, what can we do with technology today, not in the future? today is that we can take those statuses, that information that we got from Atlas RFID, from the RFID system, we can break those apart by different geometry. So what does that mean? Different geometry. Well, that different geometry, we have data against that already in the model, in the BCM, virtual construction model. We have the IDVP, the CVP, the EVP, the WBS, the turnover system, the ETC package. Uh, does everyone, everyone knows what an ETC package is, right? That's all the stuff you miss. All right. All right. So now we can break these apart by work package if we want to. Now, when we do this in this on the screen, we have three work packages, but we actually do this by the hundreds. So what would happen or what we did do successfully on projects in production is to take uh, information from material management, put it into the model of at least we do it once a week. We can do it. We can write on demand anytime we need to. But then we illustrate this information um, instead of just overviews by work package, by test package, by turnover system, by design area. And to create this, it, the automation is relatively, it's pretty easy to set up. But even to run all this, to create hundreds of saved viewpoints and export to a report actually takes minutes uh, to create all those saved viewpoints took about to make about 235 saved viewpoints took about five minutes and then we can export that to a pdf as well so the key is that we have this information but we want to get that to the end users so we need people to have that information in the model but to break it apart in the way that they need and then we can export that to a pdf as well so everyone can see that information in the pdf as well so uh the big key to this is going to be an integrated data environment where we take information from material management with the, the important, the pertinent information that we need from material management, grid location, container numbers, pick tickets. Uh, then we take that and we can combine that with other information from other sources as well. But a big key, again, that we talked about, it would be uh, just the information that you need. So with field engineers, with planners, and with party controls, you get all these different Excel spreadsheets and people are trying to do V lookups to, to correlate information. So we bring it all together for them. So you click on one object and then you have that, then you have that information at your fingertips. So that's a big key to ADVP that we we're talking about earlier is transparency. So we want everyone to be on the same page. We want everyone to have information from the owner to the contractor uh, to uh, material management systems. So we're all speaking the same language. We're all transparent. We all know the RLS tips. Um, so another thing that we can bring in is information from multiple MMSs. So why would you have multiple MMSs? Well, the answer is you don't want to, but it happens sometimes. So uh, an owner might want to have their own MMS on a project. Um, if you're doing a JV, uh, often both EPCs will want to use their own MMS. And then uh, what happens sometimes in the field is that you work with an RFID system, but uh, you still use your own MMS as well. So there's a lot of reasons why you might need to, need to pull in information from multiple sources. And those are just some examples right there. So uh, we also can pull in ADP information. So later in the conference, we're actually going to talk about CI Special Report 1901. 
uh, released in September of 2020. And this is DDP, the ADBP Data Requirements Implementation Guideline. So uh, the group who organized this is uh, a bunch of heavy hitters. I wasn't involved uh, earlier, unfortunately. I will be going forward, hopefully. Uh, but I want to read something that they put in here that's a little bit, well, it correlates to everything we've talked about earlier. And that is by standardizing the information sharing process and components, capital project stakeholders are more trans transparent and proactively plan and adapt to the inherent challenges in construction projects. This information sharing fosters alignment across stakeholders uh, who reduce risk on a capital project. So just the way that's phrased is, is the, one of the, the most important things across our entire industry. So uh, it, it was just, I wanted to read that out so you, everyone could hear that and we can talk about that in more detail and take a look at the report, CI Special Report 1901. So we look at all this information and this is great, but we can add more and more and more. So uh, on projects, uh, you want to make sure that the users are focused you don't overload them with information. However, uh, there's not a limit on how much information we can put in there as well. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Mr. Uh, William Bill Chatterton with CBOX. As, we as uh, John Walker talked about earlier, he's gonna show you his uh, IWS system. In preparing for this presentation, we were all uh, impressed with what he has to show. So over to you. Let's see, thank you, Mark and John. Appreciate the uh, comments on CBOX. Um, good morning, y'all. My name is Bill Chatterton, and I'll be covering the material handling and logistics support section. Um, I'm currently the senior consultant for global construction with CBOX. I recently retired from ExxonMobil as a senior construction advisor and site manager and have over 36 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. So moving forward, so what is needed to progress this very nuanced and well thought out conversation around advanced work packaging? It is pretty much a physical bridge between process and practice. It's taking it and moving it forward, an actual physical packaging solution that incorporates non-complex systematic material handling systems that truly facilitates the AWP processes throughout the project's life cycle. It's moving from the wood pallets to the system that you see here in the slide. Tying back to Mike's and Robert's uh, presentation earlier, it may serve as a catalyst in progressing the owner contractor's improvements for overall materials management execution, resulting in timely and cost-effective and responsive production of equipment and materials, as well as the transport and delivery to the job site and lay down yards. So as we move forward here on the physical packaging system itself, uh, before we can go further, let's kind of just define what is intermodal transport. Uh, for those not familiar with the term, um, in fact, I had to get a little educated on it as I moved from a construction environment to a uh, logistical support type of uh, environment. Very simply, it is a set of globally accepted standards for freight transportation as set forth by the International Organization for Standardization, referred to as ISO. Uh, containers, also known as intermodal or ISO containers, are the main type of equipment used in intermodal transport via rail, ship, truck, or even aircraft. Uh, the method reduces cargo handling, improves security, reduces damages and loss, and allows freight to be transported faster. So when you take this intermodal approach to efficiencies and organization in the prime characteristics of, is the prime characteristics of intermodality that works hand in glove with the efficiencies sought by the AWP practices. It is further it is future proof as the intermodal system is well established and adopted throughout the world as a gold standard for freight transportation. Now, key attributes of a comprehensive intermodal system for material handling should include safety, quality control, productivity, and resource reduction. And particularly with 
respect to resource reduction, applying a versatile and flexible intermodal system, we do anticipate a reduction in the workforce, particularly indirects when it comes to that, uh, and as well as equipment and temporary facilities where the systems allow for significant reductions to lay down yard space. Finally, subscribing to such should result in cost efficiencies and ultimately lower the total installation cost. So what value do we see when fulfilling early supplier engagement that affords a physical enablement of work packages? One is to foster track and trace best practices. We need to provide a delivery system that is really compatible with technology and can be easily integrated today. It should also be future-proof with a non-complex system so we don't have to alter the platform to confirm to emerging technology. So yes, the RFID systems definitely are changing on an ongoing basis. Uh, it's amazing how fast uh, emerging technology is, has come. So uh, we definitely need a system that just can adapt to it very quickly. Assist in resource planning is the second item. Early engagement with engineering, fabricators, and suppliers allows for the planning of intermodal components needed to support fabrication and logistics per the IWP. I'm going even deeper into not just the AWP and the CWPs, but the IWPs. The adaptable physical packaging solution should all, you know, should all also be easily sequenced from the supplier on various intermodal components shipped, received, and stored in the warehouse or laid down for the IWP progression. Plus, the non-complex yet flexible solution will simplify material handling succession. Ultimately, if packaged right, materials may not even have to be touched again until the trades need them. Obviously, the less touches, the better. And at the end of the day, utilizing equipment designed on the back of logistics expertise is only going to move the needle in the right direction. So let's look at this. Uh, let's get a recap here on the comprehensive intermodal system for your material handling needs. It should reflect the life cycle process that looks like this. Oh, something moved. <laughs> uh, starting with early engagement with the project team, contractors, suppliers, as I mentioned before, is fundamental. The supplier starts the fabrication and loads the intermodal platforms configured to the IWP, taking full advantage of the intermodal system. This commences the track and trace technology lifecycle, which is an integral part of the complete process. The intermodal physical packaging system can be readily configured and staged by the supplier awaiting release. It is then loaded into containers or may be loaded onto the trailers now that we have the option of going break bulk, transported, shipped, and received at the project site, where it can be easily organized and immediately stored in the warehouse or at the laydown yard in accordance with sequence. Once the IWPs are released and intermodal platforms are transported and loaded via forklift at the work face. Once the crews get done with uh, using, uh, pulling up the material and, and loading the racks or doing what they're doing at the front on the work face, the intermodal platforms are then collected, inventory, and returned back for future use or further use on the project or to, to the appropriate owner, uh, whether it be a leased item or a purchased item. Wrapping this up, an intermodal physical solution simplifies the logistics and material handling and bridges the gaps between the process and practice. It is efficient, optimized, and, or, and an organized system that enhances safety, um, ensures timely delivery, provides planning flexibility, reduces cost, easily integrates with track and trace, uh, improves material management and logistics, um, definitely supports the AWP process, reduces cost, and ultimately, the all objective, reduces total erection cost. So for a deeper dive on the physical 
intermodal solution. And, you know, I do invite folks to be uh, to view the, the recorded CBOX breakout session, or even go to the CBOX uh, website. So with that, I conclude. I uh, thank you very much, and now I turn this over back to Mike. All right, thanks, Bill. Um... And to summarize and bring this home and, and try to tie this back into uh, some of the information in Research Team 363 team report that's coming out, um, you really saw a lot of uh, data management and, and discussion around uh, data coming to the project team and being tracked with the uh, supply chain team down to physical ship. That really is a very key point of what these data management systems really do for projects. Um, so if you look at what's coming out in the 363 report that kind of ties all this together, um, the first thing that you're going to see is, you know, the data on details on surveys and the results and some write-ups about, you know, how that information was gathered by the research team and analyzed and put together. <clears throat> the second piece is really more falls into some of the things that we talked about here today, which is the uh, new additions to the AWP integration flowcharts. And so one of those in particular uh, calls out a need to make sure that you bring in the AWP data into the bid process, uh, which falls directly into what Mark was talking about with this special research 1901 uh, data requirements defined team. So, you know, that team went out and defined what those requirements and, and made those recommendations. And then 363 says, here's where you need to include those in your bid process. So that's how those fit together. Um, the other part that you're going to see in the research report around those additions to the flowcharts is the documented roles and responsibility recommendations of who or what role in the organization should do those, what things you should be looking for, and then also a, a brief pros and cons or benefits and risks of uh, doing that step at that point in time and then the risks of not doing that to the project team. And then tying it all together is building this true end-to-end -end supply chain. Engaging your suppliers like we talked about, looking for those collaborative opportunities, how can we communicate better together, what, uh, how, what or how we can create these win-win opportunities for all project parties. Um, and then we all benefit from working together and collaborating, having this open communication and leveraging the data that's available. And again, how does that flow? Uh, you saw some examples of some very digitalized uh, automated systems that are available here today with this presentation. And, you know, again, the company by company implementation of those uh, the recommendation is maybe look at what's available in the market and see if it makes sense for your company and, and how you want to approach uh, those software programs available in the market. Um, and then putting the people processes and technologies together uh, to make it work for your project as an owner, as an EPC, um, is really the bottom line key here. So I think uh, we'll close at that point uh, with this uh, presentation and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with everybody. Uh, I'll give and thank you. So uh, time to go to the Q&A. Um, and we do have a number of questions uh, that have come in. Uh, let me uh, ask the first one. It's from uh, Gannison. Uh, he asks, uh, what specific commitments are needed from client in order to ensure early engagement? Um, who would like to respond to that question? Uh, 
Um, I'll go ahead, we, Mike. Uh, I mean, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Um, as far as from a contractor understanding what we, we believe that we need from the client is, you know, it's kind of a, a change in philosophy and it's a, a understanding that uh, it, it helps if not only the folks that are involved early in on the AWP process, early uh, uh, working on this, that they uh, uh, go through the life cycle of the job to help support, you know, keeping a, a streamline of it. And that's a change. A lot of times the clients aren't ready to uh, uh, make those decisions early on. Um, they don't, they don't, they prefer the traditional E breaks from P, breaks from C. So uh, uh, to get the most bang out of AWP is to uh, engage the contractors early. And uh, uh, and like I said, that teaming uh, and, and both looking at things to help assure that we not only provide them the service, but we provide them the best price early on is a is a challenge, but something that uh, we can do as a as an industry. Great. Does anyone want to add anything to that before we move to the next question? Okay, so Andre um, is asking, how are the three implementation support companies working with both owners and EPCs to ensure the ROI is justified for project costs in implementing these new technologies? And uh, John, would you like to start on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, you know, ROI is obviously was you're you know selling really anything. People are asking what's what's in it for me, what's the value, and so you know, from our perspective, from the Atlas side of things, I can't speak for the other providers on here, but there's been many years, 12 years, 12 plus years of uh, client utilization of the technology, and so anytime that you're introducing a, a new concept like we've been doing over the past kind of decade. Uh, there's always obvious hesitation and, and, and you know, reluctancy to say, hey, is this really valuable for me? So um, internally as a company, we spent a tremendous amount of time uh, not only you know, implementing technologies that are out there, whether it be RFID track and trace or some sort of digital field materials management solution, but also validating uh, throughout this project's life cycle the success factors and also the value that's being derived from the field. And we do this in multiple ways. We have a, a client success team that goes out and actually works with clients and documents uh, good things that have happened as well as lessons learned and things that we can improve upon. So, um, you know, we, we take a pretty heavy focus on ensuring that what we're implementing is valuable and then also documenting that to then turn it around and say, hey, these are some, uh, you know, great client case studies and also some best practices for utilization of this type of technology. Uh, so that's what we're doing internally with that and uh, try and make that available as much as possible. And you know, organizations such as CII and Group SI and others, AWP that are out there. I mean, it's, you know, this, the formation of those groups are really based on improving productivity and best practices. And um, there's a lot of good stuff coming out of there uh, with the research teams and other, uh, other other literatures that they're producing on, on kind of value side of things too. So I encourage you all to check check those out also. But that's how we're doing it internally. Really good question. Thanks, John. Uh, and uh, Mark, uh, what can you add? So ensuring that we show ROI for the client, one is going to be to show existing success. So use projects that have been executed successfully utilizing this t same technology um, to illustrate that, hey, we're not just developing something on your project here. This is something that we've done before in production uh, successfully. And then a big key to showing ROI to a client or to anyone else is going to be to keep the eye low. So yes, we have a return on investment. And if you want a high ROI, the key, a big key is not just the return, keeping that high, but keeping the eye low. And that will give you a higher ROI. Great. And uh, Bill, uh, what can you tell us about CBOX? Um, Bill, are you on mute? There you go. <laughs> Lloyd, just Nick. 
There you go, go ahead, Nick. That's, that, that's one of the Lloyd, most common you. things uh, we hear. <laughs> go ahead, Bill. This is Nick Catanzariti. I'm the vice president of CBOX, and um, I'm here to support um, uh, the conference, of course, and as well, uh, Bill. Um, Bill did a good job with the presentation, and, and I agree uh, totally about the investment part, um, re keeping that low. And the best return I would think on investment is uh, to find the products starting early, as we've discussed in the uh, construction project during the procurement stage, engaging the suppliers with our product, the IWS, and having that product follow through the supply chain through all of the um, tracing uh, and tracking uh, from the fabricator, uh, from the supply to the fabricator, out to, from the port, uh, into destination. Um, one of the features um, with our product is we've kind of eliminated the crane heavy lift and we're able to work with forklifts um, just like we do quite often with um, all the intermodal equipment that you see in a container yard. So the reality is once the IWS is essentially a drawer, you could take any standard ISO container and instead of using open tops and flat racks for certain equipment and having crane lifts, you're able to pull the drawer open, uh, essentially open the doors and pull the IWS out of the container and then have that lifted with a standard forklift. And of course, with the space constraints that I hear about on job sites, be able to go vertically. Um, a, a lot of everything is spread out on the ground on the job sites. So could you imagine the space saved sometimes 75, 80% uh, just by going three and four high with our product. So you basically are making a shelving uh, storage rack. And of course, with the technology as discussed, uh, being able to track and trace the equipment uh, be able to see it, safety, of course, being wide open, be able to pick it and have it uh, at the job site um, with the advanced work package all ready to go, uh, ultimately providing uh, a reduced cost on the project. And with the IWS, it's our experience that this kind of equipment will last in the industry anywhere from 30 to 40 years. We see ISO containers uh, 20 years with a lot more action than what we're providing uh, just in this environment. So we're excited about the reduced I in uh, the ROI. Great, well, thanks for that, Nick. Um, we do have some unanswered questions and I'll pass them on to the panelists. Uh, but we are reaching the top of the hour, and uh, I think it's important we uh, close on time. I just want to thank everyone for uh, attending and also for uh, the uh, original presenters to be here and answer your questions. Uh, we'll be posting this on uh, YouTube through our uh, Group ASI account. So. If you have any friends that you uh, think would benefit from seeing this, please let them know. I also sent a chat message with the uh, LinkedIn um, URL for our uh, community of practice. So if you haven't already, please join. Uh, thanks very much. And we've got another session coming. Steve, is that on Thursday? Yes, uh, please join us again on Thursday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time for integrating CCNSU into the AWP work process. Thanks, everyone, and uh, be, ha be well. Thank you. Yes, thank you.